Ghana not being able to join? Yeah, about do you want to? We can to change the order. She's, okay, was she going first? Uh, no, I was going go, to go first, but my part is quick, and then uh, we were going to have her second. But I think oh, Liana just joined. Can go second, and <laughs> Liana just joined, so we're good. Oh, great! Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right, no, no crisis. Um, okay. Liana, I'm sorry that you had trouble getting in, but I'm glad that it worked out. Alex, you are once again a miracle worker. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, I think I think we are ready to start. Um, this is the session on global literary invitations, and the subtitle here is Using Children's Literature to Teach the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think is a great way of thinking about um, the future and designing the future. And so we have three speakers who are going to be co-presenting for this session, and I will introduce all three of them at once, and then I will have them take it away. And I am just pulling from their bios that are on the, the site. So I'm sorry, it's not going to be super creative, but I just want you to have this intro. So our first speaker is Dr. Vesna Dimitrieska, who is the coordinator of global education initiatives in the School of Education at Indiana University. Um, she was formerly a research and postdoctoral fellow with the IUP 16 center, so pre-K through college. School of Education. Her work focuses on expanding the world language programs in K-12 education across Indiana, as well as internationalizing P-16 education. Dr. Dimitriskias, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, okay. will you? <laughs> will you pronounce it? Yeah. Dimitrieska, okay. Research interests include uh, language teacher cognition, language teacher identity, reflective practices of teacher educators, as well as instructional practices and professional development of language teachers in foreign or second language contexts and dual immersion programs. She's published numerous articles and book chapters and leads joint IU Hamilton Lugar School of International and Global Studies NRC Title VI centers and the IU School of Education teacher workshops and professional development opportunities. I should note for you because most of you probably if you're in the world of education don't pay attention to us calling something a Title VI center, but all of us who are arranging this program today are the Title VI federally funded Center of African Studies programs at different universities. So that's why that's important. The connection. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Dimitrieska is the 2020 national recipient of the Best Practice Award in support of global and international perspectives from the American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, also the 2020 national award winner of the National Network for Early Language Learning, Award for Outstanding Support of Early Second Language Learning, and the 2014 Paul Simon Award recipient for the Promotion of Language and International Studies, a group award um, for the NRC at Indiana University. Um, the project is Bridges Children Languages World, if I'm understanding that correctly. So that's a lot of awards. I feel a little bit yeah. less. I'm alerted. sorry for that long of a bio. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. I think it's important to know when we're about to hear from people, all of the stuff that they've been working on. And I am a former classroom teacher. And whenever I see the intros for classroom teachers, they tend to be very short because I think it's very difficult to boil down made 30,000 decisions about things I never thought I would have to think about before <laughs> lunch <day>. on Tuesday. <laughs> and it's difficult, you know, and so award, it's helpful, though. It's good for us to see. Um, but I just want to say for the teachers, I want to make sure that I, I'm aware that there are many things that are not listed. Our second speaker is Leanna Brunson McLean, and she is a senior lecturer emeritus in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction and the Department of Literacy, Culture, and Language Education at the Indiana University School of Education, teaching social studies and literacy methods courses. So any of you who have a public school teaching certificate, you are familiar with those courses. Her teaching career spans more than 40 years teaching elementary school in the US and Saudi Arabia. She has provided professional development literacy support to schools in international settings, including the Cook Islands, Costa Rica, and China. In 2016, she created the Global Literacy Invitation Project to encourage Indiana classroom teachers to think and teach globally. And our third speaker is Elizabeth Bruder. She is a fifth grade teacher in Indianapolis whose goal is to empower her students to follow their passion and find their voice. 
She graduated from Indiana University with a degree in biology and Marion University with a master's in teaching. She's been recognized as her school's teacher of the year. So there's one award, which I think we should know. Um, and an Indiana University Armstrong educator and the Northeast Literacy Council's 30 under 30 educator. When she is not teaching, she spends her time playing with her toddler and hiking in state parks, which sounds great to me. Okay, so those are our three speakers. I'm going to turn it over to you, Vesna. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in case you want to share sure. yours. Yeah, and thank thanks you. a lot for that, Shane. So we'll just take it from here. Thanks for the, the intro and for um, sharing um, our bios. Um, this is just a quick overview. Let me see. Can people see my full screen? Yep, we've got a good okay. idea. Is it the presenter notes or is it the right? We see the correct thing. Okay, good, thank you. So this is just a quick overview of what we'll do today. Uh, just a quick overview of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Then how do we use picture books with the SDGs? And then we'll talk a little about classroom application um, of both picture books and the SDGs. So a little history about um, the sustainable development goals. They were a product of uh, an agenda uh, that, that was um, uh, voted for. And uh, it's an agenda that the whole world is working towards by 2030. And it's, that's what it's called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, this agenda was adopted by all the member states of the United Nations in 2015. And it is, in fact, a shared blueprint for peace, prosperity for the people and the planet, both now and into the future. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, if, for, if people are not familiar with, uh, contains 17 uh, goals and uh, which represent an urgent call for action by all countries, not just one type of country or and not another, but all both developing and developed countries to engage in a global partnerships towards achieving these sustainable development goals. This is uh, taken from uh, their website and it's, uh, it shows that the ending poverty in itself cannot be done if we don't do these things uh, with strategies that also improve health and education, that reduce inequality and spur economic growth, while at the same time we're also dealing with issues related to climate change and working to preserve our oceans and forests. So the, um, the US, these are the 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, as you can see, there is no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality. I won't go over all of them. People may be familiar with them. They are definitely a striking. It's just, I, I remember the first time I saw the image, I said, wow, I want to know more about these. I want to learn these uh, and use them in my work. And I want to do something about these as an individual, regardless as of my professional life. So um, what I personally love about them is how interconnected they all about are. It's not that if I just want to work towards no poverty, it doesn't mean that I should not be working with any of these other SDGs. And that's in fact the whole point, that they are interconnected. Um, they, um, they, they have been... There are sub five sub themes or subgroups related to the 17 SDGs, and those five are people, planet, partnership, peace, and prosperity. And then I found recently this great um, visual that shows the five P's: so people, prosperity, planet, peace, and partnership. And for each of the five P's, the goal, the larger uh, maybe goal is given here, uh, and then. For people, like they list all of the goals that are related to this subtopic. Uh, so we have no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well being, and so on. And then also the third column it gives the sector, whether it is social, economic, or environmental. So it's really uh, a matter of how, I mean, it's, it's very user friendly. If people need to, don't know where to start from, this is also another way to, if they want to do focus only on people, they can look at all the, the SDGs that focus on people. Um, they, um, yeah, and as I said, they are all interconnected. It doesn't mean that if we are working on one, we are disregarding the others. Some features of the SDGs are that they are all, they're very inclusive. They include people of different, um, they, it's not just about certain types of countries and certain types of people. Everyone can and should be working towards these goals. They're also integrated. 
and they are universal. They are for all of us. Um, if we want to save our planet, we should be all working towards solving these. So how do we use these um, uh, framework, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals um, in our teaching? We could start by doing something which is local. So we can start small with our community and then we can get bigger. We can look at the same issue in different places. We can also start global and then have an issues that are facing around the world and then look at locally those issues. So we could either start locally and then going global and, or start globally and then looking local. There are different examples of how this can be done. For example, a third grade class could do a STEM project about temperature changes in their own community. And then they could look at how those temperature changes are around the world, um, similarities and differences between the world. Um, these um, SDGs also promote systems thinking. As I said, it's not just one aspect of things. So it's multiple systems working towards the common goals of achieving these goals by 2030. So how do we use them? Uh, we, because they are both problem focused and solution focused, uh, they, um, include everyone um, because they're all large global problems that students in our planet are facing. And um, this is why teaching about them is inherently problem solved and allows for students to see creative solutions. Uh, and also at the same time, people who are involved in these, either they're, if they're students or us as individuals, as adults, feel very empowered if we feel that we are taking action, even if it's a minimal type of action towards one of these sustainable development goals. And that is the, the other, in fact, the other feature of them that we cannot, taking action can mean pro protests and things that are large scale, but it could also mean things that are very small. We could be just posting things on our social media and promoting and taking action in that way. So this is just a brief overview that I have for the SDGs, and I don't. I want to take have a. I want us to have more time to talk about them in relation to the picture books, and so that's why I'll now invite Liana uh, to talk to us about how we can use picture books with the SDGs. Thank you, Vesna. Uh, there are just uh, just thousands of absolutely beautiful, well-written children's books that um, picture books that support the, the, um, the standards uh, from the UN, the sustainable development standards. So we thought we would take this opportunity this afternoon to have you explore some of them. And so we're going to have breakout rooms um, where uh, you will get to select uh, one of the rooms that you would like to go to that is going to have a read aloud for one of the books uh, that we've selected. It's, uh, these are African themed picture books that support one or more of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these books are excellent teaching tools for you and your students to learn about Af the African uh, countries and to uh, build and develop a deeper understanding about the people. Uh, in using the books, we always uh, have the reminder to uh, avoid using the books to make cultural comparisons um, uh, uh, and also for uh, focusing on empathy. Uh, instead, we're gonna ask you to look at what these people in this particular country that this book represents, what people have and not what they don't have, uh, especially because of uh, we look at a lens through Western standards. Uh, instead, we're going to ask you to focus on, uh, in the book as you go through it, looking at how people problem solve, how they use their resources, how they persevere in difficult times, how they work together for the good of the community, how they accomplish their goals, and what they value. So uh, for your breakout groups, we're going to have a, uh, ask someone to be a scribe that will record uh, your responses because each break, uh, the great breakout uh, groups will also have six guiding questions. So after you, I would probably go over the six gu uh, guiding questions first before you begin listening to the story uh, on, on a YouTube video. And um, this, uh, then afterwards, uh, discuss these questions in your group 
the scribe will record uh, responses. And then when we reconvene as a whole group, the scribe or someone else from the group can share the group's responses. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that we are looking for, as Liana mentioned, we are looking for things. We want you to have an open mind about these things. Sometimes, as we know, books uh, and curricula that we're using, they can be too prescriptive. And then we think that that is, we, I know that we don't, but sometimes we're inclined to think that that's the only way or maybe the best way when we know that that's not the case. So that's why we're inviting you today to think big and to think how you could use some of these picture books in relation to the SDGs, but in a way that is inviting, in a way that, in, uh, that promotes students' inquiry so that it's not based on multiple choice uh, types of exercises or worksheets that are that only have one single answer, but that are more open ended uh, so that people can explore and see what they can do about it. Sometimes our students tell us or have ideas that are more maybe that we haven't thought about. And I think we also learn from that. And that's the whole point of using picture books and the SDGs. So we want to use, oh, I'm sorry, we want to use the book as a springboard. So it's not the retelling of the story, but it's the, the beginning of a, of a voyage of finding out more about this country or this particular area using the book. And as Vesna said, definitely at higher level thinking, not recall, uh, not worksheets, graphic organizers, um, just critical thinking. Yeah, so Liana, in the chat, I'll put now the Google Doc where we, where people have, um, because we have, a, we, don't, we were thinking of six breakout rooms, but I think four would be enough. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but in the chat, I'm just now including the Google Doc where you can access the books and the names of the titles of the books and the breakout room. So for example, breakout room one has one book and the SDG for it. Breakout Room 2 has another book and the SDG associated with it. I can see people joining the Google Doc, so that's good. But you can also see at the bottom of the document uh, the questions. Uh, when you scroll down, uh, the step three, it's where you can see the questions. So now I will open the, the breakout rooms. So, and I, I have, I'm doing it so that you can choose the room where you wanna go. So if you wanna discuss Mama Miti, then you can choose room number one and then join that room. And then we'd like to ask you to stay in the room where you choose so that the time is spelled, spent well. And then spend the first time of, the of uh, your time in the breakout rooms watching the YouTube listening to the story and then the rest of it about 15 minutes with the I mean and then the, the other half of it about seven or eight minutes with the people discussing so overall there will be 15 minutes half of which was, would be listening to the YouTube video and then after that discussing with the people in your rooms if you have any questions uh, we're also small groups you could also if you want uh, unmute and ask a question but uh, or use the chat but I'll now create the rooms I'm opening them now and let's see. I've never used this option of Zoom. So this is, I apologize beforehand if something is not how it should be, but um, can people choose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Great. everyone can choose to go to a room. And be sure to select someone to be the scribe to record your thoughts. I'll wait until everyone's gone, Vesna, and then I'll um, go to a room. Sounds good. Quick question. Um, the Google Doc has uh, six breakout groups. I know we're doing four, but yeah. now which, uh, which I'll remove the other six. With which book? I'll I remove the last two. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes. How do you how do you join the breakout rooms? I don't see. Yeah, I don't see it either. You click on the down in the lower. Um, bar where you have your controls there should be a button but if there's not i can move you you can just tell me which room you want to go to kelly where would you like to go um uh the water princess okay so that is room Please. uh two okay thank you and All right. hi this is eileen hovey could you put me in room two also i sure can thank you oops sorry just disappeared I'm... 
know. It starts with an E. Yeah, no, I just, my, um, my breakout rooms thing just disappeared and came back and now you're not on my list. <laughs> Hold on, let me see if I can. Are, are you also looking at the breakout rooms, Vesna? Uh, yeah, I see that there is in room one, there is just one person. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, could you, can you move Eileen? Do you still see her on the list? Yes, could you, uh, which could room you was, move yeah. Room two. Room? Move to, to room, room two, two please. Yeah. yeah. I think probably if I open it and you open it, only one of us has controls oh. over it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. No, no, it's fine. I just okay. So um I'll go to room one since there's no one else in there. Okay. Sounds good. And then Maeve. I don't know if they want to join a room or not yet. I've never used this option of Zoom. I, I've used breakout rooms many times, but not when people can join. No, okay. Now it's just the three of us. How are you both? Liana, that was stressful. <laughs> Jean, was, Jean was outside cutting the lawn and I had to I go heard, I heard you calling him. Yelling for him to come in. <laughs> and he just came in very calmly, sat down, just did what he needed to do. And someone, he contacted someone and they gave him the number for getting into, I don't know. I just stood here and watched him work magic. <laughs> it worked. So that's what's <gasps> okay. So how many people do we have all total? Uh, well, I don't know how of them are the organizers. One, well, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, overall there are eighteen, but I think three or four are from like Tavi and Shane. Okay, okay. Are from the organizers, but yeah. Okay. I had my notes here. I was all calm and prepared and ready to go. And then all of a sudden, ah! <laughs> That's, I mean, I hope you don't mind me interjecting. Oh, no, please. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, you, because I was still trying to settle down. I could tell, I could tell. That's why. Thank you. <laughs> no. I hope everybody else didn't realize this, but you know me well. No. Okay, so, um, when they come back, uh, I guess we'll just go in order. Yeah, because it's a small group. Yeah, could. yeah. And uh, they have the questions. And so they don't have to go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. They can just kind of give us an overview. Yeah. And uh, I didn't see what time was it when they went into the room. Did anyone okay. see? That's okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi. Hi. A long day for us. Yeah. How long did you want them to be in there? What did you say? Well, 15 minutes overall. Okay. So if they went in, let's say, three, I mean, by the time they settle it, maybe we can have them back at 3.37. Yeah. I'm not good at keeping time. Oh, you should see my lesson plans. I'm, yeah, I mean, now I don't teach fortunately or unfortunately, but I'm like a freak about time management. Oh, when yeah, I, I set the times, I, you know, would write it in my lessons. I knew what I would, but I would always go over or whatever. <laughs> Just, yeah. And now in retirement, there's no such thing as time. <laughs> <laughs> all right well i made the last edit five minutes ago so that means that it's good if we give them 10 more minutes yes the world doc. that's good mm -hmm. 
Is that someone connected? Hello, Ben. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's Ben or someone else because it might be someone else who's joining with someone else's uh, username. Uh, can you hear us? We're, we're having people work in a breakout room and uh, we don't know if you would like to join a breakout room. Um, in the chat, I'll include the link to a Google Doc, which contains uh, the names of picture books and a sustainable development goal that is associated with it. And then if you choose, you can choose which room you would li like to go based on the development goal on, on the SDG and the picture book, and then I can put you to that room. Hello, hi. Can you I, put me in number one, please? Drawing room number one, great, sure. Thank you. Did you also see me in the beginning after I got into the I'll resume the recording? Well, welcome back. We apologize if it was not, we know it was not in fact too much time to talk, uh, but we hope you had at least some time to brainstorm and discuss ways you could use the book and the SDGs. So now we would like to invite, um, in fact, people from all of the groups in any order to share what you've discussed. Anyone like to volunteer first? I, I was in group one, so I'll volunteer briefly because we didn't, our, our book was a little longer and we didn't have a whole lot. And no, Sakari, I'm sorry that we, you got cut off mid-sentence. Um, so a couple things. One was one of our members is a docent at a museum, and I'm sorry, I'm forgetting which African American art museum, I want to say. Can you tell us the title of your book, please? Excuse I'm me. I'm sorry. Can we had... Mama Miti. Book, Mama okay. Miti. Okay. Yeah. And um, so one was um, they do at the museum, they do a thing about uh, heroes and she rose. And she said that Matai, Matai is a good hero to talk about. And also in the museum, they have works of art that are made from sustainable or recycled materials. And so it connects well that way. And also from the story about her that she is a good um, model for leadership and innovation and sustainability. So that was one. And then the other person in our group um, in terms of teacher knowledge beforehand was just saying that he actually had the opportunity to see her speak at the University of Pittsburgh and, um, and that he thought it was helpful to understand what Kenya was like before she started her work and understand more about who she was, her background and her motivation. So that would make sense in the future. I hope I represented you all properly. Thank you, the National Museum of African Art. Thank you, the Smithsonian. That was, okay, that's it. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Anyone who would like to go next? Ileana, do you have something to add or Elizabeth? No, let's, let's keep going because I know we're running short on time. Anyone from uh, the second group from Water Princess? Um, I'll, I'll go. I'll go ahead. We didn't have a lot of time to discuss, but uh, in, important in our looking at that uh, book, which was um, uh, dealing with uh, uh, lack of access to water right, uh, and clean water, uh, was uh, making sure that uh, we, uh, we used comparisons that children would, would understand. So for example, in Indiana, we had, uh, we had some recent years of drought, right? 
uh, that would be very apparent to, to some kids. So making sure that we uh, make that connection that we have, we, we might all experience uh, water shortage, right? And, and what happens when we don't have access to water. Right? So normalizing these situations and not making it something that is from afar that only somebody else deals with. Mm -hmm. Yes, great. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tavi. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have breakout room number three, uh, quality education and the RAIN school. Hi. Uh, yes, yeah, so we talked about the RAIN school and I was sharing that uh, in my school district a, a few years ago, we had the expeditionary learning curriculum and RAIN school was one of the books that uh, we had for, I want to say third grade because I, I do second and third. But uh, anyway, I was just sharing that um, I, I would, before we would start the, to, to actually read the text, we would talk about uh, con the continent of Africa as a whole. Uh, and then we kind of discussed that Africa has 55 di different countries and Chad is one of the countries in uh, Africa. We also would uh, use the book to talk about seasons because the book is uh, talks about the rainy season and the dry season. And we have four seasons in the United States. So that was a good opportunity for us to actually compare and contrast. So we would use like a Venn diagram to kind of, you know, talk about how they're, you know, the two uh, the seasons are alike and, you know, how they're different. Um, and uh, also about, seas uh, about cycles. Um, you know, because they're going to go through this again. Thomas is, uh, he's gonna have his turn being the older brother and, you know, he's gonna show, you know, whoever his younger siblings are, they're gonna go through this same process again. So it's a good way to uh, show, uh, introduce uh, the concept of, of cycles uh, to students. So we would kind of use it, the book, uh, you know, before we would actually get into the text, those were, with some of the ways that uh, I would use it in my classroom. I mean, that, that is great. You hit on all the things, the problem solving, the, the working community, the, the student community working together for their school. Just that's great to hear that you're already doing it at your school. I hope you continue. Thank you. Great, thanks Tanisha. And then we have group four, Emmanuel's dream. Yes, so we did Emmanuel's Dream, which is a story about a young man who um, rode across Ghana with one, um, well, I'll say functioning, normally functioning leg. Uh, some of the things we, we didn't have much time to discuss, but we looked at what background knowledge teachers would need to have as they approach the text with their students. Um, and the discussion of like them having some basic understanding of location and like geographically where Ghana is, how does that compare to the US, but also more than that, like understanding cultural norms in terms of why being disabled um, is considered a cursed person and they're within their cultural context. Uh, and then additionally, um, Yasi mentioned the idea of like having a knowledge of the 17 SDGs and being ready to correlate which ones the, the text related to so you can highlight that as you you know we're reading and discussing it with your class. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. And that's the key. I think just now the three of us were a part of another professional development. We were wrapping up a project and uh, we were learning also how and the teachers were sharing how much the teachers themselves get to learn from these picture books you would think it's a picture book it's just a picture book but yes it is just a picture book but people don't know where countries are or what part of the continents they are there are what kind of features those places have and uh, so it is a, an excellent i think way to start to learn something uh, more about the world um, and I think you hit on that when you said what kind of teacher knowledge they have to have because the teachers themselves cannot, and we're not expecting and not saying that they need to know everything, but just as long as they themselves know, oh, I need to do my own research uh, and learn how, um, yeah, about these regions and places well, we in the say, world. Yeah, we say te teachers are learners, learners are teachers. Teachers can't teach what they don't know. 
And so uh, with, when you pick up a globally themed book, it should spark your curiosity before you read it to your students to go and research and find and, you know, find out more information and find companion texts to go with it, you know, put together a text set of books about a particular part of the world. It becomes a passion to you once you get started. I can honestly say that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyone else with some other comments about the book and about the um, how the I mean how we have put them under the, the SDGs and how you know the joint the, the connection between the two in fact because some people may have used the SDGs some people may have used picture books but have people use them together. Anything? I have a question. Maybe this is a silly question, but. Um... So I just recently learned about the SDGs. I'm embarrassed to say that, but um, why is it that they've been around since 2015 and teachers are not aware of this? I mean, I know in my own building, we only have about 14 classroom teachers or less and not one knew about it. <laughs> it's, and I asked my son who's 17, do you know what the SDGs are? And he said, no. <laughs> so I'm more, wondering how do we change that so that yeah. more people are exposed to it? Because this is an excellent way to connect with the SDGs. I'm actually doing it in my classroom right now. And it's, it's so easy to do and it's so exciting and the kids really like it, but why yeah. don't we know about it? Yeah. I think I, because it's, oh, I'm sorry, it's probably because it's not on the standardized test. <laughs> that's probably also, the correct answer, but that's a terrible thing. It, it makes me really mad, honestly. It's a reality, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's true. true, but it makes me really angry. I, I, I hate to so say this, excited. but I think teachers in other parts of the world know more about them and use they them do. more than here. Don't get me wrong, uh, but I have, I'm from Macedonia and I have friends who are all about them, whereas here, I get to teach people about them. And once they hear, see the framework and once they see it, it's like you, you're like, they sold immediately about it. In, they were known since 2015, before that they were the millennial goals and they were only 15. And what was not achieved with the millennial goals was turned into the SDGs. And now the, the good or the bad thing is that we have a few more years to achieve them. Uh, but, the, and, and I think the framework is just so comprehensive and, interrelated that I think it makes for making those cross-curricular connections so easy. Thank you. I'd like to, to jump in here regarding the SDGs. <clears throat> I'm Helen Bond from Howard University. I'm also co-chairing the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Mm -hmm. and wow. It's a United <laughs> Nations affiliate, but along with Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia as the president, and we have another co-chair from Yale, another co-chair from UC San Diego, Gordon McCourt. And it's an affiliate organization under the United Nations. And the very role and the purpose is to really support education for sustainable development and also support you know, the SDG implementation worldwide. We made several presentations at COP26 just this last week. But, and what we found, and I also co-chair a smaller working group within SDSN, it's called Diversity, Equity, and Justice for, for the Sustainable Development Goals. And we've produced several reports on how well the United States is making progress, especially regarding uh, minority Black and Brown and Indigenous communities toward these SDGs. But getting back to the, the question I thought was a really great question from the teacher, um, <clears throat> I co-authored with UNESCO, which is the academic arm of the United Nations, a great, um, well, I, well, we, we think it's great. It's a, it's a great learning tool, educator, teacher's guide that was, is a, was originally distributed to the ASPNET schools, which is an associated school network of UNESCO, of the United Nations, where they sort of, you know, field test and you know, send materials out to, to, you know, to get feedback. I'm going to drop in the chat because it's really a great educator's guide. It's called Trash Hack uh, Action Learning for, for Educators, and it focuses on uh, waste. I'm just going to drop the link in there. But there's, there's an entire <clears throat> movement around ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. 
Uh, and so you're absolutely right, everyone, that needs to be a higher level of visibility in the United States. And that's one of the things. The, and of course now, SDSN, UN, SDSN, they have chapters all over the world. SDSN Africa, SDSN Amazon. And we just started a United Nations chapter in the United States about four years ago. It's based out of Columbia and Jeffrey Sachs is the head of that. I'm just one of four co-chairs, but just to, and I'll, I'll leave the link in there for that, but I'd just like to leave that with you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for sharing that. That's amazing. Yeah. You could, you should have co-presented with us. I'm sorry if we misrepresented something. <laughs> no, 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 perfect, perfect, perfect. Could I ask Helen a question? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I teach um, second graders and it's really hard to teach them about some of the goals because they don't have the background for what it's even talking about. I find that really difficult. Do you have suggestions? I mean, life underwater, life on land, they get all of those. Um, equity, they, they get that. But what about some of the ones that are more difficult? Do you have any resources for that? I've searched and I really haven't found anything that's good. Yeah, well, thank you, Kelly. That's a wonderful question. Um, that, that the guide, the link that I just put in is a, actually a great resource, but there are other resources and the place to really to go to look for that again is UNESCO. UNESCO okay. has really pioneered a lot of work in that area, but the guidebook for teachers, you can go to the website and it describes it, then you can download it. But we made it very teacher Friendly. We used a lot of interesting graphs, and there are actually lesson plans that you can actually use. Uh, but I'm so glad that, that you're interested. It's not a language that that's that's really used, and the goals aren't you know not even really by by the government. But um, but I think we we are making some some headway into that. But UNESCO is a great resource, and if you look up Education for Sustainable Development (ESD). And UNESCO, there are some tools there. And okay. it overlaps with a lot of other things as well, mm -hmm. like global citizenship education pioneered by, by UNESCO. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Kelly. I do appreciate that question. Thank you very much. Great. I love the discussion uh, and uh, all the exchanges and all the new things we've learned. Uh, now I want us to give some room to Elizabeth because she has so much to share with us. I was impressed when I first heard her what she's been doing with picture books and the SDGs. And I'm, when an opportunity came up um, with Tavi, we decided to invite a practicing teacher who does this every day in her classroom. So I don't wanna to talk too much. I just wanted Elizabeth to share. Yeah, thanks so much. It's really nice to meet you all. And I'm taking notes as you all are talking as well. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you've heard of the good life goals, but it's more palatable for younger students. So you might want to start there. Um, that's an option as well. I'm going to put in the chat just a resource that I use in my room that I've developed over the last year as I've been kind of tackling this. Um, so if you are interested, you're welcome to um, use or lose share my screen here and kind of, oh, I gave away my hosting power, Shane. Can you give it back to me? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so I um, actually did a summer institute about the SDGs and was inspired to just take it and run with it. Um, like I said, or like my bio said, I'm, I'm really into empowering my students to, to make a change. And so this seemed like the perfect gateway for that. Um, so I had some goals going into this project. I teach fifth grade and oftentimes we don't have enough time to just enjoy picture books. So I love the idea of just reading a story a week to them. Um, of course, learning about the SDGs, integrating the goals into the existing curriculum, because we all know that teachers are short on time. We have standards that we have to cover. And so finding those, um, those ways to do that organically really was helpful as well. And then of course, inspiring my students to take action. So the first goal was to just enjoy picture books. So on Monday, we would do something called Make a Change Monday, where I would read one book tied to one of the SDGs. The books were chosen with a global lens so that we could also learn about different countries. And then we tracked our connections and learnings on a bulletin board. And I'll show you that here in a second. 
Um, so here's just a list of some of the books and then you, then the chat, I've also sent you the list as well so that you can view them at your leisure. Um, but here is a picture of my messy, messy room and our bulletin board that we use in order to make connections between the goals. Um, for example, if we look at the water princess, even though I was reading it for clean water and sanitation, as we read about it, we realized, oh, there's some connections to gender equality and there's connections to good health and well-being. So we were trying to show that these goals are incredibly interconnected. Um, as the year went on, we also learned that making um, progress on one goal might take away progress from another goal. So that was something that was kind of interesting to kind of develop and come to that realization as well. And I can talk a little bit more about that um, later on. But having the picture books posted and the goals posted at the front of my room kept them fresh in my mind all year to make sure that we were constantly referring to them. And it allowed my kids to kind of track where we've been with the different goals. So after we would read on Mondays, we would spend about 10 to 15 minutes a day the rest of the week on a broad overview of the goal. I built this into my morning meeting time. Um, we have a time set aside in the morning for social emotional learning and I would just take 10 minutes to talk about these sorts of things. We would learn about the countries, um, really making sure that we're developing an appreciation for the culture of the country, not just viewing Uganda because they're struggling with quality education, but really appreciating all that Uganda has to offer and recognizing that all countries have issues with education. We're just using Uganda as sort of a springboard to, to discuss that. We would look at graphs and statistics, which was good math tie-in. Um, just a quick infographic search will we'll give you lots of information. Also the Sustainable Development Goals website has a lot of these infographics as well. Um, talking about percentages, trends over time, just made for good discussion. We would review the targets. So underneath each goal, there are um, several targets um, affiliated with them. Um, and this became important that I just shared with my kids about them because at the end of the year, they then went on to pick a specific target that they wanted to tackle. So uh, it was more really during the first 17 weeks of just introducing the goals, I kind of just threw the images up there and kind of saw where the conversation went. Uh, we would watch clips. Um, on YouTube or short video clips to talk about the goals to kind of put in perspective for them. Um, thank you COVID for introducing me to virtual field trips because we were able to go to places like Florida and Nigeria via Zoom, which was really cool where we could talk to different people and um, learn about them, do, do things that we never would have done before, before the Zoom of it all. So um, that was pretty, pretty exciting. We invited guest speakers to come in to share their experiences tied with the goals as well. Um, so that was really powerful um, for my students to hear people who are actively working on the goals and making connections there. And then um, some simulations as well in order for them to, to experience kind of what the goals feel like. So after we would spend seven, or I guess in addition to spending those 10 to 15 minutes a day for the rest of the week, I really wanted to find spots where the goals fit naturally into our curriculum. So my motto in my room, even for my students is let's work smarter, not harder. So I reviewed the curriculum and I was able to find natural connections. For example, current events are a launching point for conversation. During Red Ribbon Week, the goal we focused on was good health and well-being. The week of Martin Luther King Day, we focused on reduced inequalities. It was the election year, so we talked about peace, justice, and strong institutions. Um, I also went through my standards and thought, are there any places that these already already connect. So lots of science standards naturally connected to life below water, life on land. The result, we do an engineering unit that tied into industry innovation and infrastructure. So just looking for those natural connections. We read other books beyond picture books. And so finding the books that we already read and just reframing them. So I already read to my students A Long Walk to Water for a novel engineering project. Only this time I'm gonna bring up the goals as we're reading so that it, it feels more organic. Um, units that we already did, uh, we have a persuasive writing unit. Instead of um, convincing our principals that we need more recess time, we learned about Heifer International and try to convince our families to take some action with us as a, as a group. So just reframing the units that we already did with a different lens. 
And then finally, looking at the goals historically, um, in fifth grade, we're responsible for um, early American history standards. And so thinking about over time, where do some of these goals pop up? And we're thinking about um, Native Americans or explorers or all those things. We, we see these goals kind of pop up here or there. Uh, just this week, we were learning about the starving time in Jamestown. So we, we learned about zero hunger this week and made the connection that way. Um, a bit of a stretch, but I think it worked out. <laughs> Um, and then my ultimate goal was to inspire my students to take action. I wanted them to think globally. So we use the picture books to kind of learn about the world, but our action is gonna be local so that it actually can, can, can be something. So I asked my kids around March, what goal are you passionate about? And let's learn about it. So what changes can we make to our own behaviors? How can we enact change in our school or our local community? That was kind of the driving questions for this part of the project. Um, during the year, um, we talked about some action projects as a collective class that we could take. When we were learning about zero hunger, my kids realized, hey, we have these food rescue bags during breakfast in the morning, but at lunch, we have to dump everything. So is there a way that we could reduce food waste at lunch? So the kids wrote a persuasive letter to our principals and our cafeteria staff asking for those food rescue bags and kind of giving reasons why we should have them. Um, unfortunately, this is when we went virtual again, and so this one kind of fell flat, but when we came back in person, I had these darling girls take it upon themselves to try it again in a different way. They created a business where they um, made little squishies out of paper and stuffed cotton balls inside. They sold them to their classmates for a dollar a pop and raised over $300 for a hashtag lunch bag, which was just the most incredible thing. Um, they were incredibly proud of themselves. It was a good economics lesson. So there was a lot of um, cross-curricular things happening there as well. Um, some other action projects that my kids took on, I don't know if you remember the um, viral ice bucket challenge to raise money for ALS, but I had some students who wanted to collect cans for our food pantry, and so they created the viral can-can challenge where they recorded themselves dancing to the can-can and then sent it to other classes in the school, and then they would record themselves and send it on, and then we would collect cans that way. Um, these students decided to create a believers club where they just wanted to come together with like-minded people and just talk about things that they believed in and that they wanted to change in our school. Um, there was not a dry eye from the adults in this Zoom call. We were all very touched by just the conversations these kids were having, um, and it was very empowering for them to to lead this club and just talk about things that were that were important to them and meaningful to them. And then I had a group of students who wanted to um, raise money for uh, Mental Health America. So they sponsored a hat day where the students in the building would pay 50 cents to wear a hat and then they would um, wear the hat and then <laughs> collect that money and then it was donated. So that was pretty empowering too. So all of this kind of led to this mock UN summit at the end of the year. It was a culminating project. The students were able to pick a goal, a target, and a country that they were passionate about. They did lots of research on those three things. They learned about their country, became passionate about the culture of their country. Um, they learned about their their goal, and then they tried to learn about how the, the goal and the country was connected. We had um, amazing volunteers from IU. They were students who signed up to help. And so we were able to connect all of our kids either one-on-one -on -one with a mentor or in like small groups of two to three. So everybody had a helper that they were checking in with as the week went on. Um, and then they presented their findings at our mock UN summit with the premise being that the UN has limited resources. So convince them that your issue is most worthy of their time. So this was a two day presentation. Um, every student had the chance to present to their classmates and their families via Zoom uh, or like a YouTube live stream, I guess it was. And then we had a set of judges who picked our top presentations to then present to the school community the following day. Um, that included a keynote speaker. The students wrote a song and performed the song. Um, they had gave the speeches. The whole, the entire school was invited 
excited to zoom in with us there. Hopefully this year we can do some of these things in person, but hey, we, we figured it out virtually. Um, so if you're thinking about where could you begin, I recommend starting small. I kind of just went all in and, and did it, but I certainly had the help of many supportive colleagues um, that I know. So if you're just your own self, start small. You can pick one goal or a category of goals um, that Esna had talked about earlier. Um, using the SDG website for inspiration. Um, I just make sure that I'm reading news stories and anytime something pops up, you know, sea turtles choking on plastic, I make sure to share that with my students so that we can have organic conversations about it. I really found it powerful to display the SDGs on the wall, not only so that I remember to make connections back to them, but that my students are keeping them fresh in their minds and looking for those connections themselves. Um, maybe reframing one lesson or a unit with an SDG in mind to begin, and then just keep it organic. Um, for example, this year when there was the earthquake in Haiti, it gave us kind of a springboard to talk about infrastructure. And then that kind of gave us a springboard to talk about how could we help. And so there was just kind of this organic action project that um, stemmed from that as well. So just finding those natural things that are coming up that kids are bringing up anyway and, and, and taking them and running with them. Um, if you have any questions or you want to reach out or you want to partner with me on anything, please reach out because I, I want to continue this and I love to talk to other educators about what they're doing. So um, let me know. Throw it back to you, Vesna. Yeah, no, uh, this was amazing. I'm speechless, but I've heard this before. I'll have other people comment and ask questions because I think you have more to share than I do at this point. <laughs> All I can say is, wow, I couldn't write things down fast enough. I was trying to take pictures of the screen so I didn't miss it. Really, really interesting stuff you're doing and great work. It makes me really inspired to do that as well. Yeah. And I know, Kelly, we spoke uh, and I've spoken to Lily, but Elizabeth was a part. She started off with an institute that we offered here at IU uh, on the sustainable development goals. And there were also, I think there was a fellowship that she collaborated with someone to develop the units that helped. And all of these possibilities are possible for other people as well. And I know Tavi is nodding, uh, this is just like a plug, but we do want to do this with other people and more teachers because there are definitely resources and absolutely manpower or woman power available <laughs> here to do all of these things. But um, yeah, any other thoughts or questions from the others or comments or Kelly from YouTube? <laughs> Don't let me talk, I could dominate it because it's so <laughs> interesting to me. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Does anyone else have questions? You could put it in the chat or raise your hand or however you. What I would just like to add to it for Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a wonderful example of a teacher that is not being held back by having to follow the standards. She has gone, she has learned how to work it and she has created something in, much more interesting than the basic Indiana standards for fifth grade. But she is, I mean, it's, it's that creativity and she has it. And that's what we want in teaching. And that's what's gonna keep Elizabeth in the classroom probably for 20 years teaching because she's creative and she's getting such great results from her teachers. So what an example for any teacher, whether you are a, a veteran teacher or just starting out, it's that creativity and learning how to meander and work around all of the restrictions that are put on you many times by standards. Yeah, I can see someone raises their hand. I know it's not Ben, it's <laughs> someone else. So you feel free to unmute and ask the question or put it in the chat. It's Edith, right? Edith Michelle. Um, I wanted to say, I think it's a great, um, you did a great job. I am, um, you know, by day, my job is for a parks and recreation agency. And I have all, often lamented the fact that uh, the United States has not embr embraced the UN SDG goal of uh, fundamentally every child should have a right to play. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I think it's wonderful that you have integrated these these standards in your day to day, because we are a much more interconnected, interconnected global community, and we should really be supporting um, these kinds of standards across all institutions, across all disciplines. 
And so thank you for doing that. Absolutely. I so agree because it's not just the education. It's everyone. It's all of us at a personal level too. Yeah. I have a question if no one else does, but I don't want to take up space if other people do. Um, my question is for you also, Elizabeth, but, um, but also Vesna and Liana, maybe you have examples. I am curious when you're doing this in your classroom, how much movement back and forth is there in terms of talking about the SDGs in the US and other places? Because I know when I was teaching, um, my students tended to default to seeing problems that they could solve in other countries, but not seeing ourselves the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's something I'm really trying to work on this year as I'm trying to recreate the magic of this project again. Um, truly trying to bring up to the students like, okay, we're learning about poverty in Paraguay. However, there is poverty in, in our own community. And then when we get to the, the action piece, I think it's really important to help them recognize that the change can start local in order to, to kind of make waves globally. So kind of inspiring them to think about what can we do in the here and now, like, sure, we can raise money for boreholes in Malawi, but we can also, you know, just make sure that we're taken care of in our own community as well. As you said, Elizabeth, uh, making them aware of the problems that are in, in the United States, because many people don't realize, I mean, we have have states, areas where people do not have fresh, good water or sewage, or, you know, they are, it's, uh, what is it, uh, food deprived areas. So that's something that, that has to be incorporated into our teaching. And, but we teach it locally and we teach it globally. It's, it's both ways. So we don't look like we are the country that has everything and we are helping the, you know, the underserved countries in, in other parts of the world. That they, they can save everyone else. Yes, the great, the great saviors. <laughs> Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, I think for my students, it was always challenging to, to talk about the idea that poverty as a category exists in the world, but it looks different in different mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. And what does it look like in each of those places? But what, what's similar to it? Are there other questions from the group? Um, do you have ideas? I'm hoping that um, about how you can use this now. Kelly, I have the impression that you do and also a couple of other people commented. If you wanna drop something in the chat about how you're thinking or what you might think about using this for, I think that would be a great way to, to wrap up our. I would like to encourage everyone to look at the, the book list uh, of um, the sustainable goals, the children's picture books that are matched with the goals. Um, those are the, some of the ones that we use today came from the list, but there, there's just a plethora of, of books that match with the goals, picture books. And picture books can also be used in the upper grades, middle schools, and in high school. And there is, I think, yeah, that's, that's sorry, for interrupting, I just saw a question in the, the chat. I was going to also add that the, the world's largest lesson is also organized around the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So you can check that out. And there, the resources are divided by grade level. And that's where the picture books are coming from, too. So uh, and then I see that, Elizabeth, there is a question for you about how much um, time you spend invest in planning your lessons or units. <laughs> Uh, who can say, right? Billable hours, I don't know. <laughs> um, I Fortunately for me, it is a passion and I do love doing it. I would also just take it a step at a time. So this wasn't like I sat down one Sunday and created 17 weeks worth of lesson plans. It was a work in progress. Um, a lot of it is just kind of reframing the lesson plans that I already have. For example, I have a persuasive writing unit, only this time we're going to do it with the goals in mind instead. Um, so trying to 
trying to figure that out. I, again, if you can find guest speakers or virtual field trips, that takes a lot off your plate because then they're going to do the teaching for you and you can follow up with conversations. So that was really helpful um, as well. For when I, I would say, if I really think about it, I might spend like an hour at the beginning of each week kind of researching and learning about the country, about the goal in order to help facilitate the conversations. And then of course, with teaching like this, the students are going to bring up their own things. So then you're always adapting and adjusting. So um, all I can say is I love to do it. So I don't watch the clock <laughs> as, I, as I do it. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Shane and Tavi for the opportunity to share this with everyone and you do have our emails uh, and do feel free to reach out because we would love to partner on things with you and um, yeah in any way. Thank you. That's great. And um, any any of you presenters, Elizabeth, you put your email in the chat, I think. Anyone else who's willing to take follow up questions, please put your email in the chat. That would be great. Yeah, and if you want to save yourself time on lesson planning, I can send you what I have. So just reach out. <laughs> I would just like to add an, a, another resource. The National Museum of African Art has a Facebook page. And at least once a week, they feature an artifact from the museum and talk about not just the, the piece, but talk about it from uh, a variety of contexts. If it has a sustainable context, if it has a uh, something about the materials and so it's not a picture book but it is another way of of, of having a picture of an object and and engaging a conversation um, depending on what your lesson plan is so i don't know if it's organized in a, any kind of archive but um you know it might be a resource um you know because they pop them up every week so i'm, I'm not really sure how they have established you know what they're going to do next but it might be yes. another having another source. And there's some great, you know, great pictures. And actually, not just the National Museum of African Art, the Smithsonian has a, a, a teacher resource that is an electronic database of a number of things across their museum, across the museum system. Museum of um, uh, um, Air and Space Museum, Natural History. Um, and it's supposed to be, you know, accessible to teachers and uh, families. And uh, it's a great resource. I'm sorry, I don't have the link to it. Uh, but uh, I think if you do a Google search of the Smithsonian's database uh, research um, sources, uh, it'll show, it should come up. I know they pumped it up, particularly during the quarantine period uh, yeah. of COVID. And so, um, I'm just offering it up. I was not using that particular resource, but uh, I think it uh, may be valuable. You Great know, thank session. you for thank you for bringing that up. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, so that I can get actually get to those <laughs> for the Smithsonian and for the National Museum of African Art is that they have those uh, posted on their Instagram. And of course, if you have older students, they're accessing Instagram, right? Uh, yes. they're you they've got those IG accounts and so yes. I follow them and I will often just post them for the for them to to see and and reflect on uh, so yes those are great resources and again really easy to just follow on Instagram and share out the ones that you think are pertinent yeah yeah that's great thank you okay well that's not what you're going to say something no, just thank you again. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for um, you, Vesna and Liana and Elizabeth all for presenting. I think this was really helpful and Tavi for the connection because um, you were the one who brought them into our program. Um, and for everyone, I just wanna let you know where we are in our schedule right now. Um, so it is now 1.20 my time, 4.20 East Coast time, in between that, where, depending upon where you are. And um, we have two sessions left. The, the next one is session three. So in the history social studies option, there is a 
one called Interrogating Development for a Better Future. In the literature one, there is one called Expanding Our Literary Imagination, Teaching Nigerian Lit. That should say in a high school, it's three teachers who've created a Nigerian Lit course who are talking about that. Um, the other option in arts and visual arts is Nollywood's Africa and the Inventions of the American Mind. So that's gonna be looking at film, but from the Nollywood perspective. And then the fourth one, which is in the STEM session is called the Ethos of Entrepreneurship. And the presenter is gonna be a young man who I know from UC Berkeley named Cecil, who created a company in Kenya um, to provide low cost, sustainable, um, charcoal, which I know sounds sustainable and charcoal don't go together, but he can explain what anyway. So, um, so that's the, the next session, um, which will start in eight minutes. And then the last one at the end of the day, after you've all been sitting all day, we have a talk and a dance tutorial for Jerusalem. So I will Stop That's a that. great day. I did that every single day during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Well, get ready because oh. get ready because that's how we're ending the day. So, um, awesome. I think that's it. I will um, I will leave you there. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you in one of the next sessions. And thank you again to our guests. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>